HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. Today's program has been brought to you by Fairway Market, like no other market, a New York City institution that sells the best local, national, and international artisan foods for prices that can't be beat. For more information, visit fairwaymarket.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit heritageradionetwork.org for thousands more. All right. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Heritage Radio Network. We are coming to you, as always, live from the back of Roberta's Pizza on a beautiful day here in Bushwick, Brooklyn. You are listening to The Farm Report, and I'm your host, Erin Fairbanks. And today we are joined in studio by Jerry Calderi. Jerry, welcome to the studio. Hi, Erin. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. So, Jerry, you are an architect um, for your own firm, Bromley Calderi Architects, and that that might seem a little peculiar to regular listeners of my my show. Why are we Why are we bringing an architect onto the Farm Report? And um, you're about to find out, folks. Stay tuned at the edge of your seats, because um, Jerry, you were the principal architect of the Brooklyn Grange. Is that correct? Yeah, we do a lot of work with. Uh with Ben and Gwen from Brooklyn Grange Farm, and we were the architects of record for their rooftop farm at, on Northern Boulevard, the first farm. It's uh, one acre on the roof of the Standard Motor Products building. Um, so that's how we got into that, yeah. So I have to imagine that when um, Ben and Gwen, when they're like, okay, we're going to do a rooftop farm, and they're looking around, they're like, which of the many architects who are qualified in this field can we choose from? I mean, I'm guessing that probably wasn't the case. How did you guys connect? Well, it was kind of by default, but urban farming and using rooftops has been something that we've been interested in for a long time. Uh, most of the projects that we do, we at least propose a green roof for. So it uh, just it happens that we were the architects for the building renovation. We were working with the owners. And G- Gwen later told me the story that when they had approached other owners or other people about doing farms on their roof, these people said, you people are crazy. And when they approached us, we were like, wow, that sounds like a great idea. You know, how can we help? So I got enlisted to, to work with those guys and, and really developed into quite a nice partnership. So um, I want to be clear with the listeners about what role the architect would take in a rooftop farm. What are, what are the kind of facets of the farm that they're looking to you for guidance on? Well, there's a few. Um, there's planning, you know, planning work. Uh, there's the technical aspects of uh, load support and drainage. And then there's the bureaucratic stuff of filing with the Department of Buildings. So in the case of Brooklyn Grange, we helped with planning and laying out the farm because we need to be sure that we have uh, fire department access. Um, We worked with a a consulting structural engineer because we ended up putting over a million pounds of engineered soil on the roof. We had to ensure this wasn't going to land in the sixth floor tenant space. Um, And then finally, we ended up, we uh, filed all the paperwork with the city. We got permits, we changed the use of the roof. It was actually the first time a farm had been filed in the city of New York in over 100 years, so it was kind of fun. 
Wow. So, so it's not as simple as, you know, bringing up a couple of shovels full of, of dirt and, and here you go. Well, it could be, but uh, not to do it on any kind of like a commercial or a scaled basis. I mean, Brooklyn Grange, what made them interesting and intriguing to us is that it wasn't like a science project. It was a, a business plan with a business model, and they were interested in making a commercial venue out of urban farming. And that was interesting for us. So the two kind of things that you talked about that I want to um, tuck into a little bit more, the load support and the drainage. So load support means what? Well, generally speaking, roofs are designed to carry a load, a live load of 30 pounds per square foot. Uh, a farm will add about 35 pounds a square foot for a roof. So before you can begin to plan a farm project on a roof, you have to ensure that the roof as it stands is designed to carry that additional load, or if it can't, then how do you augment the structure so that it would be able to carry that load? That's the most important consideration in terms of, you know, that, that technical aspect. So um, here, you know, we're, we're obviously in New York City. You guys, um, I'm, I'm, assi- I'm assuming, do most of your operations based in the New York metro area. Is that right? That's a fair assumption, yeah. So the, the way the kind of... Um, the the building uh, I don't know the building what is it called terroir of our space mm-hmm. you know we're not th- there's always b- new buildings going up and then there's like refabbing of old buildings and when you're looking at the kind of uh, the the load support the the four four roofs um, is this working into you know is there any kind of like trend in this direction with regards to refabbing buildings or looking at new structures where that's like part of the criteria that you check off now if you're like a if you're a developer in this space sometimes yes like for example we're involved with a lot of old buildings in brooklyn and queens primarily uh industrial buildings we're also the architects for the pfizer building on flushing avenue which you know a big part of the food movement is in is in the pfizer building We've worked on Scalamandre. We're looking at a couple of other properties in Long Island City. Primarily, these are buildings that we would call loft buildings. But for the most part, when you look more closely at them, they're large, concrete-framed brick buildings that have roofs that can sustain some serious loading. The floor loads are usually 200 pounds a square foot. So we look at those kinds of buildings as candidates. Normally, if we see a building that's a brick building with wood roof framing, it's generally not going to be a candidate to carry this kind of weight. And then the drainage question, because obviously if you're, you know, pouring water onto soil to make things grow, that, you know, most of that, I'm assuming a fair amount of that water is going to get absorbed, but it, it, you know, that's a process that takes time, and and then if there's extra water, it has to go somewhere. So what are some of the drainage considerations, and how does your work play into that? Well, typically green roofs... Um, act as a way of ameliorating the stormwater situation in New York City. In fact, there's a number of programs in New York where landlords can get money <clears throat> to install a green roof because part of that green roof system holds water, keeps water out of the storm system by nature of the fact that the soil is absorbent. And then underneath the soil, between the root barrier and the drainage mat, there's generally some kind of a filter fabric, and that filter fabric also holds water, <clears throat> which the soil then wicks up. So what we're talking about in terms of drainage is really allowing the excess water to drain freely. So around the roof drains, we generally have like a catch basin, which is like a, looks like chicken wire, but a little bit stronger than chicken wire to keep stuff out of the drains. And those drains are generally surrounded by some smooth river stones, again, to allow water to flow into the drain naturally so that the excess water can be drained off the roof. And then that, that's going into, what, a pipe that takes it down a street level and into the sewage system? Into the system? sewage system. Normally, what we've been trying to do with owners is to get the owners to do kind of like a gray water system where we'll capture the roof water in a tank or a cistern and then pump it back up for dry day irrigations. That's a little bit harder of a sell, but we've been getting some traction with that. And what are, you know, I know that there's a difference between building a farm on a roof and building like a really great garden you know, are we talking like worlds apart from a design perspective or? Not worlds apart, but they are different functions and they're different end uses. Like a, a farm like Brooklyn Grange is pretty much a commercial venture and that the design of that is geared toward that commercial 
venture. There's also an educational component. Brook and Grange is probably the leader in having people come to the farms and learn about education. I mean, learn about farming, learn about urban agriculture. A lot of children have, have passed through. Uh, so the emphasis really is on functionality. We've done other kinds of green roofs for people where there are gardens, including vegetable components, uh, but they're more, you know, they're more designed for hanging out. There's more conversation areas, or sitting areas, cooking areas, whatever. In this particular case, it's really about a working farm. About a working farm. And so, obviously, you know, Brooklyn Grange in many ways is a flagship um, here in New York City, but I think more and more across the, the country and globally for uh, innovation in that rooftop space. Um, so, we want, obviously, lessons learned. Um, you know, if you had a magic wand and could go back in time to the beginning of the project, can you maybe take us through some things that went really well that you were happy with and some things you were like, ah, we would have done that differently, like now that we know? That's a hard one to answer because I'm not really involved in the farming operations, and I know that uh, the farmers have learned tremendous amount in the years about how we've installed the soil, uh, the way that we created the mounds and the aisles for the soil, um, how they do their farming practices with seeds and plants. From our perspective as an architect, what we would try to encourage people, building owners to do and, and people to do, is to install the, the roof you know, in the proper fashion. So lately we've been designing some other projects with Green Roofs and we've, we're doing a couple of others with Brooklyn Grange as well. And um, we, we've learned like how to assess the building properly, um, how to ensure that we're, not casting sh- that we're not having shadows cast on plants that need sun and no shadows cast on plants that would rather have shade. So some of that kind of orientation stuff we've become better at. We've become better at staging and thinking through the entire process of how you organize the materials and then disperse them. And as far as, you know, obviously um, your your firm is not a charitable operation. No. So can, can you give us a sense from, you know, a cost perspective for someone coming in wanting to start a, a project like this, what are some of the things that they should be thinking about in their budget with regards to the, the role that a, a team like yours would play? Well, there's a certain amount of costs that are, that come, in, come with the territory of doing business in New York City. So in New York City, it's very hard to just go to the Department of Buildings and file an application. There's all tremendous amount of form work that has to be done. So typically, we hire what's called a expediter, code consultant expediter. And we would file, normally we'd file an Alt-2 application. Sometimes we file an Alt-1. It depends upon a number of conditions happening in the building. But those costs can range anywhere from like 2500 bucks to about 10000 bucks. Wow. From our perspective, this is kind of a thing that we're doing out of a sense of passion. We're not really making money on the farming projects because the amount of time and energy really can't be billed that way. So we generally charge on some kind of a... You know, how are we going to work this out? Are we getting money from the DEP? Is this all coming from your pocket? Is this investors? And we try to keep our fees to a minimum. And so the the kind of expediter position that you were talking about, yeah, I mean, in my head, I'm like, is this like when you give the maitre d, you know, 20 bucks to get you a table faster? Or is it, it's, you know, I know there's obviously like a benefit to having someone who's super familiar with the system, who knows the people, who knows the kind of like, grammar of putting everything perfectly um you know you're really just paying for that kind of service and those connections or okay i can think i can explain it um it's kind of like the maitre d aspect but to file an application you need about uh 10 different forms they have to be filled out correctly then they have to be taken to the department of buildings and filed with certain desks in a certain fashion then the application, depending upon the type of whether it's like self-certified, if it's going to be examined, if it's going to be reviewed, there's that whole checklist of things to do. Then you have to get all the insurance forms, etc., in order to pull the permit. So we can do this ourselves, and we have done it ourselves, but it's unpleasant and time-consuming. And so into that little vacuum came this expediting business. And now it's, uh, it's prevalent. Very few, if any, people go to the department themselves and deal with this. 
Yeah, so it's kind of like you're you're paying for the service of someone who is going to be the like a you know, a CPA for example. Yeah, like exactly. I could do my own taxes. I mean, okay. I can hop on TurboTax and fill that shit out. But like, your own teeth, you know, <laughs> yeah, I could do my own teeth. Well, that you know, given the state of my teeth, I might be a little bit more hesitant. The brushing I've got down, the flossing I can handle. Um, well, I want to talk a little bit more about kind of the um, the climate in New York City for these types of projects. Um, I'm, I'm imagining the like warmth of reception has has shifted a bit over the last you know decade, but but maybe not. Can you talk a little bit about kind of generally you know is the city uh, or the state? I'm not really sure where things come into play. Facilitating these types of projects, standing in the way, is it different depending on what aspect? Give us a little sense of like how do we take the temperature of things right now. Well, I can tell you a story. Like, Ten years ago, we uh, were proposing, along with a real estate company, a development company, to purchase uh, a very large building here in Brooklyn, and we were going to develop this building. And our proposal was urban agriculture, essentially to make the building itself an indoor-outdoor farm. And the response to that from the developer was that they were going to find another architect. Now we're finding that developers and owners of buildings uh, are approaching us with the idea of, is my building a candidate? Is it feasible? Can I do it? And we've, in the past month, because now people start thinking about it, it's becoming spring, winter's over. In the past month, we've looked at two large rooftops in Long Island City that would like to be, you know, would like to get this wheels in motion somehow. So I think that's a big improvement. The DEP is offering What's the, DEP for the people? Department of Environmental Protection in uh-huh. New York City that has a grant program. And one of the things that they're trying to do is keep water out of the sewer system and out of the storm system. As you know, when it pours rain, a lot of neighborhoods, they get semi-flooded. So the DEP is offering grants for people who have ideas about ways to keep water out of the system. Uh, one of the most popular is green roofs. So we've been applying for, for DEP grants and going through that process. And I think with uh, Brooklyn Grange, we're going to win two of those grants. Awesome. So that's a, that's a groundswell change. There was also a program which closed, the window on that program closed about a year ago, where New York City was offering tax abatements to building owners for green roofs and they weren't really offering them for rooftop farms, but we convinced them that a rooftop farm was the ultimate kind of a green roof. So we won at that time for the building owners at Northern Boulevard. We won a one hundred thousand dollar tax abatement, one time tax abatement. That program is closed, but we're you know pushing for other programs like that, and that's like an inducement to owners as well. So looking at getting benefits not only um, in the form of paying less taxes but also maybe getting a little extra cash or just i don't know kind of is there also like an ease in the the process of doing it i mean which maybe just comes from experience where people aren't like explain to me the concept of a green roof like that has maybe gone away that's pretty much gone away i think people still need to hear that there's a a real finite set of benefits that that come from installing a green roof from a building owner's perspective it reduces your air conditioning costs. Um, You're creating essentially a giant heat sink at the top of the building during the cooling season. So air conditioning costs are are reduced. Uh, It extends the life of your roof. So if you have a 100,000 square foot footprint or a 50,000 square foot footprint and you put a new roof on your building, by covering it with an overburden, you'll double the life of that roof. So there's a a benefit to that. Uh, From the city's perspective and a citizen's perspective, it reduces what's called the urban heat island effect. If you ever go up on your roof in the summer, you notice how hot it is. If you go up on the farm in the summer, it's it's not as hot. You know, there's definitely an effect that happens because of the because of the soil, the transpiration, and all that. Interesting. So some of those climate impacts. Well, we're going to take just a short break. Uh, You're listening to The Farm Report. I'm your host, Aaron Fairbanks, and we are talking green roofs with Jerry Calderi here on the Heritage Radio Network. Hang tight. We'll be right back.
Today's music is by Tackstar on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. Hi, I'm Steve Jenkins from Fairway Markets. I've devoted my idiot career to the old ways, the old recipes, the old tools, the old geography of where serious foods come from for centuries. And I've strived to make these wonderful things available to New Yorkers for 37 years. So it's a fait accompli for us to support Heritage Radio Network. And I hope you will too, and I hope you'll keep tuning in. For more information, please visit fairwaymarket.com. All right, we're back. You've tuned into the Farm Report. We are talking green roofs and, and rooftop farms with Jerry Calderi of Bromley Calderi Architects. So before the break, we were talking about some of the additional benefits of, of greening your roof, um, reducing your air conditioning, extending the life of your, um, the actual life of your roof. Uh, and then um, for the city, you know, rainwater recapture, you have reductions in the like heat island effect. So, um, what are some of the, I want to think a little bit about what are some of the other ancillary benefits. I think uh, in the agriculture world, the urban farm farming movement can be a touch contentious for folks because they're like, you know, we're not going to feed the, you know, feed the world on green roofs. Um, so, you know, that being said, we've talked about some of the other, some of the benefits from, from the building standpoint, but for, for people, for consumers, what are some of the other things that you see as a benefit to the building space or the community of having, of having these kind of green roofs or uh, rooftop farms? Well, like, for example, if you live in the country or if you go away for the weekend or whatnot, you can go to a farm stand and buy some kind of vegetable that was picked 15 minutes ago. Normally, urban residents and city dwellers don't have that opportunity. So as, the, as rooftop farming spreads and as urban farming also at grade spreads, you know, the prevalence of being able to do that is going to increase. And I think that's a benefit for, for people uh, generally. Also, restaurants can purchase uh, no locally grown food. So it's like kind of very local. It's, uh, it's greener, if you will, fresher food. I think that's a huge benefit. And I think it's also something that people can do on a scale. You know, I mean, you could grow, you could put tomatoes in a window box out on your windowsill or some small containers on your roof to, to grow some stuff. And there's tremendous satisfaction that you get from growing something and then eating it. Right. And so if I'm putting a, you know, a planter out my window, I, I may not need to call on your services. But yeah, Probably not, but it would be fun. <laughs> I mean, I think it would be great if you walked around the city and you saw window boxes everywhere with, uh, you know, basil and tomatoes. And it's, I... I I'm excited by the fact that you can grow things to eat inside the city. Yeah, and I think you touched a little bit earlier on one of the other things that I see as a primary benefit of having these types of gardens or farms in an urban environment, which is the education factor. Um, you know, Brooklyn Grange has really been a leader at bringing people in and talking about growing. Um, but even on an individual level, when you're doing things at a smaller scale, I think there's something that can be quite transformative. Well, New York City's always had a history of neighborhood gardens. And if you look, if you remember, there used to be gardens on the Lower East Side. There's gardens in Harlem. There's gardens in the Bronx. New York City has a wonderful tradition of at-grade urban gardens where, you know, flowers and herbs and vegetables and plants are grown. And older people would be teaching younger people these skills and passing that tradition on. And I think now that people are, you know, making this more of a business model and a place to work and educating um, students, um, I think that the tradition is going to continue, and it's going to be stronger. And the uh, quality of the food is going to be grown is going to be much better. Both of my sons did an internship on the roof last summer, and they loved it. They learned a tremendous amount, and they realized the possibilities if you think a little bit wider. Right. Well, thinking a little bit wider, what are some other examples of ways to kind of green your roof? I mean, maybe you're not going to grow food, but there's other things that folks can do. Absolutely. We're, we're doing a couple of roofs now that are just grown with sedum, um, which is a, about two inches high, inch and a half high. It's not walkable, but it's a very quick growing natural plant that's very resistant to the sun, to drought, to, to lots of rain, little rain very hardy kind of a, of a species. They come in mats, or you can plant them. 
So we've been doing a couple of green roof designs with those, and we've been getting those in the range of 11 to 12 pounds a square foot saturated. You always have to think of the saturated weight, not the dry weight. So the saturated weight being like when it's pouring rain, Soaking how much they're going to yeah, hold. How much they're going to weight, right, yeah. exactly. Well, that being said, you know, obviously we're coming off of a long and snowy winter. Mm-hmm. Um, do, you know, as as we're seeing kind of the weather becoming less and less predictable or like extreme weather events becoming more um, frequent, you know, what does that bring up for these types of operations? Um, you know, are you having to or do you anticipate having to kind of reimagine um, how you're going to deal with some of those weight or drainage issues um, when you're getting a ton of snow or a ton of rainfall or those types of issues? Well, typically, you know, most roofs are sized for a snow load. We live in the Northeast. That's kind of part of the calculation. And I think what the, the future is holding and what we've been looking into with people and what we see a lot of also being published in the newspapers are greenhouses, rooftop greenhouses. Uh, New York City passed a zoning resolution, or they amended the zoning res- resolution recently to say that if you had an active greenhouse on your building, that that enclosed area wouldn't be counted as part of your floor area. So essentially what it means is you can increase your floor area of the building by putting a greenhouse on your roof, and now you can grow all year round. There's been a lot of that uh, new, very new project happening here in Brooklyn. Uh, There's been a bunch of projects, a couple of projects in Manhattan for schools with greenhouses. Uh, And I think that's, you know, the way we're going to see a lot more of that. So increasing your floor area, I mean, so what, I mean, what are the benefits of that zoning change? Is it that you can actually just do it or is that like you're, you're not being taxed on that additional extra space or what? I mean, I'm not, maybe I'm missing something here. Okay. Well, the floor area, there's a maximum amount of enclosed area you can have on, on a site, on a lot. On building okay. Lot. okay. So if you've maxed out your floor area, that means that's it. So for like a footprint of, so I have a, you know, vacant lot. Right. And when I first apply to make a building, you're going to tell me you can do X amount of floor area. Right. So I do that. And, and then, then you can get a little bonus area for a greenhouse. Got it. Got so it. That's what we're talking about. Nice. Um, well, I'm wondering if you have a sense of how New York City compares to other metropolitan areas. Um you know, around this issue? Are we ahead of the curve, in the middle, behind? I mean, where are you looking for kind of leadership or where are you getting calls from? We're getting, most of the calls we're getting from are from New York. Um, Chicago was a little bit out out ahead of the curve in front of us in that they have some laws on the books about green roofs on public buildings. Um, I like to think that New York's ahead of the curve on everything. Me too. um, You know, I'm a little chauvinistic in that respect. But it's just fun to be part of this whole thing. I mean, for us as architects, it's interesting because usually the architect's the person in charge of the project. But in these kinds of projects, we take direction from the farmers. And we're like just one member of the team. So for me, personally, it's interesting because I'm learning a lot about something that I'm interested in but really didn't know much about. Maybe you could share a story uh, um, for us. I mean, I have found in my experience that... um there is a skill to learning how to kind of communicate with farmers of different types. There's farm speak, so to speak. And, and I would assume that there's something similar for architects. You know, each profession tends to have its own language. So can you, can you maybe share with us some, some, some spots where, you know, you and Ben were kind of like have, you know, had to kind of overcome some of those challenges? Ben's pretty plain spoken and he has an engineering background. So it was, it was kind of easy for us to communicate and, and talk, but about two weeks ago, we all ate lunch together because we tried to have lunch like once or twice a year, just casual and, and sit at a table and eat. And uh, Anastasia and Gwen had been on trips, and the trips that they took their vacations were to farms. I mean, they went to California to an asparagus farm, and this was the topic of conversation, was about you know how to irrigation, and you know seed propagation and and what they were doing and, and to me that was fascinating because it is like architects or doctors or whomever when they get together they have a technical conversation which seems normal and natural but the the buzzwords and the keywords are all different yeah and there you are fun. at the you know, table like <laughs> my head was going back and forth well maybe you can give us a little insight into the kind of 
the architect world, I mean, I'm sure, you know, obviously there's, you know, listservs and magazines and, and you know, awards and things that are, like, specific to your field. Are you seeing um, a rise in the kind of um, promotion, recognition, thinking around uh, green spaces and green, green roofs in particular? Absolutely. I mean, that's been happening for many years. You know, the American Institute of Architects has the what they call COTE, the Committee on the Environment, uh, there's the LEED, the Leader in Environmental and Energy Design, I forget the acronym. Um, there's the U- United States Green Building Council. So there's a lot of organizations that are dedicated toward you know, sustainable architecture and sustainable design, with green roofs and urban farming being one component of that. You know, there's all kinds of you know, f- energy reduction movements, recycling movements, uh, both in terms of building materials and the waste products that buildings produce so so that i so we can feel ambitious or not we can feel optimistic about the future absolutely you got to be optimistic about the future. <laughs> well jerry thank you so much for taking some time out to join me in the studio today thanks for having me Aaron. i appreciate it so now if folks want to learn more about you and your work they should visit the website www.bromleycaldere.com thank you awesome thanks so much for tuning in this has been another episode of the farm report This program, like all 35 of our live weekly shows, are available for free. You can find us at www.heritageradionetwork.org or take a look for us on Stitcher Smart Radio and iTunes. We are a member-supported organization, so when you visit the website, click that Donate tab and become a member today. Thanks so much for listening and stay tuned in. Thanks for listening to this program on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore Radio. You can email us questions at any time at info at HeritageRadioNetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening.